Hello, my name is Richard Duncan. I'm an orthopedic spinal surgeon uh, in Johnson City, Tennessee, and I've been in practice here since uh, 1994 at Watauga Orthopedics. I practice primarily uh, spinal surgery in the cervical and lumbar spine. I've created these videos in an attempt to uh, give you an overview and an idea of what a typical procedure involves. Each procedure is different, each patient is different, each pathology is different, and it's important to understand that, again, this is a typical uh, experience and uh, there are specific risk and benefits that go along with each procedure, and you and I will carefully go over that in the office and discuss each uh, procedure uh, and the risk associated with that. This minimally invasive fusion can be done through a very small incision allowing for faster recovery to be done as an outpatient and faster healing time. This is an MRI scan of a patient with a herniated disc. This herniated disc uh, shown here, this is the right side. Uh, this is the back of the patient and the front of the patient. This is the spinal sac in the very center. The left side here shows the herniated disc pressing on the nerve. The herniated disc is beneath the joint there so that to try to go in and take out the disc, I have to remove the joint. This is a unique situation that requires stabilization of the spine once the disc has been removed. By using this minimally invasive system, we're able to take out the disc, take away some of the facet joint, and then stabilize this with this interspinous process device. This is the device that we use. It's made of titanium. It has a hole in the middle that allows us to pack bone graft in. This device clamps down across the spinous processes and allows for uh, the stabilization of the spine. Here we are first starting the operation, taking the pressure off the nerve and removing any disc that would be pressing on the nerve uh, to get rid of the leg pain. Following this, then we'll perform the stabilization portion of the procedure. We're doing this part of the procedure under the microscope. We're now preparing the device by placing a bone putty and some of the patient's own bone into the barrel of the device. Once we've done that, we then use the instrumentation to carefully place the device in between the spinous processes. Once we've placed it between the spinous processes, we remove the rest of the instrumentation, which uh, allows us to leave the device in place. Once the device is in place, then we have a series of clamps uh, that goes on and allows us to clamp down along the spinous processes. This keeps the uh, vertebra distracted and holds it in place while allowing for the fusion to take place. You can see here we've got the uh, device in. Now we're clamping that down. This is squeezing on either side of the spinous process and this gives us our stability. Once we've done that and we're sure that we're in good position, then we'll use a, a small screwdriver to, tor to turn the uh, torque screw in the device and this locks the device in place. Once we've done this, then we can also place uh, more bone graft uh, in behind the device uh, that adds to our uh, fusion. This is a post-operative x-ray of the device in place clamped across the spinous processes of L4 and L5. This allows stabilization while the fusion takes place. The patient is up and moving in a brace, can return to driving and to uh, office work within seven to 10 days, uh, using the brace to avoid bending and twisting lifting for the first eight weeks. The surgery itself takes about an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. The patient goes home typically in the afternoon. This is an AP view of the clamp in place across the spinous process, allowing for stabilization and fusion. 